Thank you, Brent. It's good to see everyone. We're going to have to start putting some uh, of those ropes. Remember those ropes they used to put like across pews back in the day? We're going to put those in the back half of the chair blocks so everyone will have to come up here a little closer. That's what we're going to do. And uh, when we went to two services, we thanked God for that, for the need to go to two services as we were overfilling the building. But my wife said, Who, who's, how do you think that's going to break down? I said, oh, I've seen this many times. I know things, you see. I said, it will be very few people at the first service and the vast majority at the second service. And I was 100% wrong. And that did not surprise her. And so we have a mob at the first service. You had to wade through them to get in here. And now those of you that come to the second service, it's a quieter crowd. And we appreciate that. But, um, but we do need to not be afraid. We're going to start making people come sit up front. We want to be a family here. But it is good to be with everyone after being away for a little bit. Um, two weeks ago, glad to be back. And we are continuing to look um, at the genealogy of Jesus, or the family portrait, the family tree of Jesus. And so over the last two weeks, Brent has zoomed in on that picture. And we see in that portrait of Jesus' family some surprising individuals. And Brent showed us that by including the likes of Rahab, the prostitute, and Ruth, the Moabitess in Jesus' family tree. We see that Jesus came to be one with to, to rub shoulders with, to sympathize with, and to save sinners even like you and me, absorbing the wrath of God that we deserve. Now, this morning, we're going to hold this family portrait out at arm's length. And we're going to take a look together at the whole picture instead of zeroing in on just one individual. Now, I've been to some of your houses, and some of you have family pictures on the wall. And I love looking at people's picture walls. You learn a lot about a family by looking at their pictures, older pictures, newer pictures. Some of you have some great photos on the wall, like all of your great aunts with, you know, beehives and the cat eye glasses. And I've seen some pictures of dads and grandpas and uncles in the 70s when all the hair was feathered and the jean shorts were entirely too short. And um, it's fun, it's interesting to look at those pictures on the wall and get a sense of a family. So this morning, we're going to hold this picture out a little bit and get a sense of the entire family tree, the whole family picture in Matthew 1, specifically verses 1 to 17 is where Matthew fleshes out Jesus' genealogy. What we're going to see is that it's really arranged like three group photos side by side on the wall three panels of names that are the same length that are selectively and artistically arranged by Matthew in order to teach us Jesus' genealogy. Now, there's two major problems with preaching any genealogy, and especially this genealogy. And this becomes part of the mystery of Christmas. There are just some things that we will never fully understand as we grapple with the reality that God became man in Christ, born as a baby and laid in a manger. Part of that mystery um, I'll get to in a moment. But genealogy has got to be, if we were to take a survey, everyone's least favorite portions of Scripture. When you say genealogy, immediately you think boring. It's a long list of names most of which you've never heard of, uh, very few of which you're certain that you can pronounce, and um, therefore you wonder, is this relevant to me? But reading a genealogy on the surface seems at first like reading the phone book. Smith, Aaron. Smith, Alex. Smith, and on it goes. And we wonder, why am I reading all these names. Uh, some of you would rather read the ingredients on the shampoo bottle than read the genealogies in Scripture. And so we say genealogy, and automatically we have to ask, why is this genealogy relevant to my life today? 
we also have promises in God's Word about God's Word. And we know that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for, for life change, for correction and reproof, for training and righteousness, that the man of God may be equipped, ready for every good work. And we believe that that's true of genealogies as well as the more exciting bits. This is part of the mystery of the Gospels and of the account of Jesus' birth. So first, there's the challenge of relevance. Is this genealogy relevant to my life? But secondly, and interestingly, there's a challenge of reliability. And so we're going to wade into this just briefly this morning because this makes up part of the grand mystery of Christmas and what we learn about Jesus. Well, the trouble is that Matthew's genealogy here in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17, is not the only genealogy of Jesus' life that we get. Because Luke, in Luke chapter 3, verses 23 to 38, also records a genealogy of Jesus. Now, saying that, automatically you're assuming that those two genealogies are the same and just make up some repeated material in the Bible. Just like some of the Proverbs are repeated. Um, but that's not the case. We're going to take a very brief look at uh, these two genealogies and simply point out that there are some significant differences between the two. So significant that those that seek to discredit the Bible often point to these two genealogies of Jesus and say, see, your Bible is full of inaccuracies. These two family trees don't even line up. And so we're going to take a brief look at that and ask, do they line up? Is there explanation for this? And what we're going to see in part is that there is a level of mystery here that we may never fully understand. And I want to suggest to you that there is a sense in which that is not only okay, but very appropriate in God's will for our lives. The minute we think we can understand everything about God, even about His revelation to us, we are on shaky ground. And we're trying to put ourselves in the place of our omniscient Father. So, while we don't have more than a few minutes to spend on this second issue, we will address it briefly. But my goal this morning is not to answer all of our questions. That's impossible. My goal isn't to iron out every difficulty with this text. Also impossible. Neither is my goal to send you home with three neat, tidy applications from this text. That might be possible, but I don't think it was Matthew's goal in writing it, so it's not my goal in preaching it. My hope this morning is that you will marvel at the mystery of the manger. That's my goal in preaching this genealogy this morning. And we're talking about God becoming man in order to die. Those are two things that God doesn't do. God is not like us. He is not a human. God also doesn't die. He is eternal in the heavens. He reigns forever. And yet at Christmas, we talk about God becoming man in order to die, in order to turn away God's just wrath for sin and reconcile offending creatures back to their creator. There is frankly much here that we will never fully plumb the depths of, and that's okay. But there is much here that should stop us dead in our tracks in awe-struck wonder, as the hymn writer said in thankful amazement, in worshipful marvel. My hope for us this morning is that we can marvel again at the mystery of the manger. So before I read Matthew 1, especially verses 1 to 17 to begin, listen to how Diedrich Bonhoeffer describes the incarnation, God coming in flesh, as he reflects on Christmas. In fact, you can Google Diedrich Bonhoeffer. I don't know how to spell it either. That's what Google's for. And, um, and Christmas, Reflections on Christmas. And you can get this little Christmas Advent devotional and uh, just a wonderful resource. But here's what he writes about the incarnation, about the God-man, Jesus. He said, no priest, no theologian stood at the manger of Bethlehem. And yet all Christian theology has its origin in the wonder of all wonders that God became a human. Holy theology arises from knees bent before the mystery of the divine child in the stable. 
Without the holy night, there is no theology. God is revealed in flesh, the God human, Jesus Christ. That is the holy mystery that theology came into being to protect and preserve. How we fail to understand when we think that the task of theology is to solve the mystery of God, to drag it down to the flat, ordinary wisdom of human experience and reason. Its sole office, theology, is to preserve the miracle as miracle, to comprehend, defend, and glorify God's mystery precisely as mystery. Now, Bonhoeffer isn't saying that we should shrug our shoulders and assume that nothing is knowable. Bonhoeffer isn't saying that we should soft pedal in our interpretation of Scripture or our engagement with theology. Bonhoeffer himself had a PhD in theology and dedicated his life to studying the text as deeply as he was able and teaching it as clearly and thoroughly as God would enable him. And he did so so effective, uh, so effectively he ended up dying in a concentration camp during World War II for his faithful obedience unto God and seeking to protect the Jews. And so I tend to listen when he writes. He's a very helpful individual to read. And I agree with Bonhoeffer that there is a degree of mystery embedded in that manger in God becoming man that we will never fully plumb the depths of. But that does not mean that we shrug our shoulders and walk away. It means that we draw nearer, we listen harder, we look longer, and we allow God to lift our hearts in reverent worship as we marvel again at the mystery of the manger. So that's my goal this morning. Now let me read to you to begin Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. This is the Word of God. Matthew writes the book of the genealogy or generations or beginning of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. And Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram, and Ram, the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, uh, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. Now David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Mm. Solomon, uh, the father of Rehoboam. And Rehoboam is the father of Abijah. And Abijah the father of Asaph. And Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat the father of Joram. And Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. After the deportation of Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Atzor, Atzor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Akim, and Akim the father of Eliud, Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Matan. And Matan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. Let's pray. 
Father, we always need your help in understanding your word. Father, you've taught us it's by the Spirit's work of illumination that we understand who you are, what Christ has done, who we are in Christ through your living, active, inspired word. And so, Father, we stand dependent on you this morning for the help of your Spirit, and we pray that you would give us light this morning, Father. Shine in our hearts. Help us to understand the truth of your word. And Father, show us how this genealogy is not only trustworthy, but relevant for our lives today. And Father, I pray that as we come to you and your word this morning, that our hearts would be warmed within us with love for you as we stand amazed, Father, amazed at the manger, amazed at Emmanuel, God with us. Father, help us to marvel. We pray all of this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, let's take a look at the beginning and end of this genealogy very briefly. Matthew writes this genealogy really in verses 2 to 16. He's a historian. He's gone down quite possibly to the temple where some believe that the genealogical records were kept. He's gone to wherever these were kept and done some research. We know this because Luke, in putting his gospel together, speaks of doing orderly research and writing an orderly account, and surely Matthew has done the same. And he writes this genealogy, but then in the beginning and the end, he gives us an introduction and a conclusion because he's a good writer. So look at verse 1 again. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, much is said about Jesus, even just in this first chapter. Uh, then across this, this early portion of Matthew, chapters 1 to 4, and throughout the book. And yet, what Matthew wants us to know about Jesus is encapsulated right here in verse 1. Four things we're told, I'll simply mention them. Jesus, well, that name means God saves well, we see that unpacked, not only in the genealogy, but the book. Uh, Jesus Christ, well, Christ means Messiah. It's just a Greek version of that Hebrew word for Messiah, which means anointed one, and specifically the one anointed by God's Spirit for God's service to do all that we we're told the Messiah would do. So we have Jesus, God saves, Christ, who is the Messiah. And then Matthew tells us the son of David, the son of Abraham one who is descended from the very physical line of David, which means he has a right to reign on David's throne. Moreover, he's the physical heir of Abraham, the one to whom many promises were made, and we'll read one of them as we go. But what we see is that Jesus is the one that we watch through Matthew to see if he can truly fulfill this high statement in the beginning that he is God saves, that he is the anointed Messiah, that he is the one in whom the promises to King David can be fulfilled, and if he is the one in whom the promises to Abraham, which by the way are promises to bless the families of the whole world, can be fulfilled. So listen, when I write papers for school, I just finished my semester Wednesday officially. I'm still recovering. And um, when I write papers for school, I try not to set the bar too high at the beginning of a paper. You want to make low claims and then deliver as well as you can on them. If you make a high claim in your introduction, you've got to deliver. Well, Matthew has made the highest claim he could possibly claim about Jesus. And boy, in the rest of the book does he deliver. But look now at the end. Uh, look, at, look at verse 17. Here is Matthew's summary. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon uh, to the Christ, 14 generations. Now, if you go and compare these lists, especially the first two groups of 14 generations to the Old Testament and the list of kings, you realize that Matthew has omitted some names. 
Why would he do that? Is he lying to us? No, because the standard convention of Hebrew genealogies allowed for omitting names. Um, when I was out as a child, I spent a lot of time um, in the woods on various hills around our houses, especially in the fall and winter of the year. And sometimes I might run into another uh, man there that I didn't know. And if I was talking to that man, if he said, son, who are you? Are you supposed to be here? I would say, yes, um, I'm Elwood Ellis' grandson. Now at that point, he said, oh, okay, all right, young man, very good. Because everyone knew my grandfather. He was one of the patriarchs there on the hills where I grew up. And they said, excellent, young man. That's, it's so good to, to meet you. I've heard about you. Well, I wasn't lying to list my grandfather as the one to whom I belonged rather than my father. I was stating my lineage in a way that would most communicate to the individual I was talking to. Now, in Hebrew genealogy, this is what they did. You could list a grandfather and skip great to a grand, uh, straight to a grandson, and people understood what you were doing. You're still proving the traceable genealogy of this individual. And so Matthew has intentionally omitted some names in order to choose 14 names from Abraham to David, from David uh, to the deportation to Babylon, from the return from the deportation to the birth of Jesus. Why? Because Matthew is a good writer. And Matthew wants to make this easy to understand and even memorize for those in early oral cultures. Furthermore, because Matthew is intentional. And I think that he wants to remind us that everything that God does, he does on purpose. He does intentionally. He does well. I think this is his way, using these 14 generations three times over, using some conventions of the day to show us that when God brought Jesus into the world, he did so perfectly, he did so intentionally, and he did so at exactly the right time through exactly the right people. And this is why Matthew has structured the genealogy this way. But I want you to see finally that of these three panels of names... Matthew wants us to focus on two in particular, the one dealing with Abraham and the one dealing with David. But even beyond that, Matthew's focus is really on David. Now, this is very subtle in the text, but it's there if you look closely. We're told 14 generations in all three, but in truth, there's 14 names in this first panel from Abraham to David, but only 13 generations using the formula that Matthew's using here, so-and-so was the father of in the middle panel, David, the deportation, there are fully 14 generations using the formula with which Matthew is writing. And again, in the last panel, there's 14 names, but really only 13 generations. Well, why would, why would Matthew do that? Again, I think that he has done this to arrange the material with David and his kin in the center. And we see as we continue to read throughout the book of Matthew that Matthew was very concerned with Jesus as the king of God's arriving kingdom. And so it serves Matthew well in his account of Jesus' life to stress King David and Jesus' physical and legal right to sit on the throne of King David. Now, that's enough about the genealogy, but I want you to hear that. I want you to know that when you dig into even the genealogies, there is much there to be discovered and to enrich our souls. So this material is arranged precisely and artistically. But as I said, there are some differences between Matthew 1, 2 to 16, and Luke 3, 23 to 38. Now let me just give you a brief catalog of them and say a few words. Number one, Luke's genealogy is longer with 77 names, or 78 if we count God, and Matthew's is shorter with about 45 names. Um, the span is different. Luke's genealogy runs from Jesus to Adam. Matthew's runs from Jesus to Abraham. The direction, interestingly, is different. Luke's genealogy ascends. It goes up the family tree from Jesus, while Matthew's descends, coming down the family tree to Jesus. And finally, and this is the one that we have to deal with, the names are different. Now, from Abraham to David, what we see are the same names. But when we get to David and his son, something happens. Matthew traces Jesus' line through David's son, Solomon. Isn't that interesting? 
Yet, Luke traces Jesus' line through David's son, Nathan. Therefore, from that point onward, the names are widely divergent until we get finally down to just two generations from Jesus. And in Matthew, we're told that the name of Joseph's father is Jacob. But in Luke, we're told that the name of Joseph's father is Heli. Now again, critics of God, critics of Christianity, critics of Scripture have said, look at these lists, they don't even line up. Who are you people kidding? Your book is full of errors. I want you to be aware of that, so that if that is pointed out to you, it's not the first time that you've seen it. Now, I would say to you two things. Number one, we have to admit in humility that the best scholars for 2,000 years have not been able to be certain as to exactly why these lists differ. And it's important to admit the limits of our knowledge. I have less problem doing that the older I get. Um, life has a way of knocking you down a bit, doesn't it? Um, humility can be a hard-fought battle, but the older you get and the more you study, the more you realize you don't know. And so it's okay to admit that there are things in Scripture that we cannot with 100% certainty account for. That's why there are very godly individuals with different interpretations of certain things. But number two, I want you to know this. There have been multiple, reasonable, very possible explanations put forward as to why these two lists are different. One explanation is very simply that Matthew is tracing Joseph's genealogy. Now that's relevant. Though Jesus was not the physical son of Joseph, he was the adoptive son of Joseph. Joseph raised him, claimed him as his son, and therefore Jesus had every legal right of every other member of Joseph's household. Those who hold to this view say that Luke, on the other hand, is tracing Mary's genealogy um, because Mary is the physical, biological mother of Jesus. And so, if this is true, then Jesus actually would have a double claim to the throne of David because his physical mother is a physical descendant of David, and he could point to that in the genealogical records and say, yes, I am of the line of Abraham and David, and because of Joseph, my adoptive father, I also am legally an heir of Abraham and David specifically. If that's true, it gives Jesus a double claim to be who Matthew says he is. But if that's true, we have another problem, because both simply refer to the father of Jesus and then give two different names. However, on that score, <laughs> father there doesn't mean father. It means something more like um, ancestor, descendant. It's more in that vein. So you could use that word to refer to a grandfather, even to an uncle that has taken responsibility for a person in a family line, or even for a father-in-law. And so some would argue that that is Mary's father listed there, but they're mentioning Joseph because genealogies often work that way. So now you can see why I want to say in humility, I can't tell you with 100% certainty how exactly these names came to be divergent. But I can tell you that there are multiple very possible ways to line these up and understand them as both pointing to the genealogy of Jesus. Um, now, significant, as far as I know, nobody balked at these genealogies in the first and second centuries. Now, I haven't done enough work on that yet, but as far as I know, in the first few centuries, there were many ways that people sought to discredit Jesus, but as far as I know, nobody tried to line up those two genealogies and says this is bunk, meaning they were probably provable at least up until the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem when we think a lot of records were destroyed. So that's very interesting to me. So all that to say, do not let the difference between these genealogies in any way, shape, or form trouble you. We know that these are included in God's inspired word for a reason. And rather than seeking to iron that out and saying, Eureka, I've got it, academic paper forthcoming, um, what we need to do rather is read, 
affirm, believe, both, and marvel at the mystery of God's will. We trust Him in those things that we cannot yet fully understand. So, that's just a little bit about the genealogy itself, but now I want to get into it. We've answered that question of reliability. I do believe this is absolutely, completely as reliable as every other portion of God's Word. I want to talk about relevance now. And I want to look at this the way that Matthew does. He is intent on focusing our attention on Abraham and David. And so I want to do that with you. Look back at verse 2. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob. You may remember in Genesis 12, 2 and 3, God chooses a man named Abraham. So far as we can tell, he's minding his own business, and God begins speaking to him. I have to imagine that was terrifying, but we just get a snippet of it. I like to imagine what that would have been like. What we know is that God begins speaking to Abraham. Abraham listens. God says, Abraham, go to the land that I will show you. And what's amazing is that Abraham has faith in God, faith enough to obey. Now, if I said to you, go in the direction that I will, the land that I will show you, which way would you walk? Here, poor Abraham is given instructions to go to a land that God hasn't yet, okay, Lord, I'm willing, I mean, I'm here, God, to hear is to obey, I am your servant. If you could just, I don't know. I don't know exactly how God led him step by step to where he was going, but I know that Abraham in faith was willing to embrace something of the mystery of God's will for his life and for the salvation of many throughout the world. And so Abraham, embracing what was mysterious to him and trusting what he did know plainly, acted in faith and went And slowly but surely, God led him into this land. But God had said this to him specifically, Abraham, Genesis 12, 2 and 3, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now it's that last line that's hard to grab hold of. Up until that point, God had created large family groups at that point. There were nations on the earth. You could envision having descendants and building a large clan, becoming a nation. But then God said, uh, Abraham, by the way, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He just transcended space and time. And I wonder if even Abraham scratched his head but it was part of the mystery he was willing to marvel at and just act in obedience as he went. Now, you may remember that this was also a case of miraculous birth. Both Abraham and Sarah were not able to have children by natural means. And yet, God blessed them. In their very old age, God blessed them with a child. And what was that child's name, do you remember? Isaac, yeah, we just read it. Isaac was the natural heir of the promises to Abraham. Isaac was the long-awaited promised son, the son who Abraham may have felt was the fulfillment of this promise. And in many senses, he surely was. And yet, Isaac was a sinner and did not bring God's blessing to all the nations by himself. In no way did he accomplish that. Genesis 26, 6 and 7, we read, So Isaac settled in Gerar. And when the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, Oh, she's my sister. For he feared to say, My wife, thinking lest the men of this place should kill me because of Rebekah, because she was attractive in appearance. Now, uh, in an act of cowardly self-preservation, Despite the promises of God to turn his descendants into a nation, he felt like the best thing to do was to lie, was to manipulate the circumstances, to put his wife at risk to save his hide. 
Now, where do you think he learned such a dirty trick? You ever read Genesis? He learned it from Abraham, his father, who did the exact same thing when traveling in dangerous regions. And what we see is that while there is a promise to Abraham that will be fulfilled by one of his heirs, what we see is that um, Abraham has been passing down more than just this promise. He has passed down his sin nature and even some of his specific sins that apparently run in the family. And Isaac is a good student. And so he's learned from his father not only how to trust God, which at times he does well, but also how to turn his back on God, how to sin. And by this point, we begin to think, I don't think Isaac is the one to fulfill this promise to bless the whole world as an heir of Abraham. And we might stop and ask the question, well, then why did God choose Abraham and Isaac in the first place? Well, that's part of the mystery. And we're glad that it is. Because it points to another great mystery, the fact that God can choose and use sinners like us to be part of his family and to accomplish his will for the glory of his name. Now that's a mystery we ought to marvel at, brothers and sisters. When's the last time you looked deeply into your own heart? When's the last time you took stock of your past and your sins? We ought to marvel at the wonderful, amazing, grace-filled fact that God can choose and use sinners like you and I to not only know Him and be a vital part of His family, but to serve Him and glorify Him and enjoy Him forever. Now, that's a mystery that we ought to marvel at at Christmas time. It's a blessed mystery that God can choose and use liars, manipulators, the fearful, and those who doubt he can save us from those sins and change us and employ us for His glory, even you and I. And that's why God became human. That's part of the mystery of the manger, and we should marvel at this mystery. But back to the text, to fulfill the promises made to Abraham, God would have to raise up somebody else. Somebody else would have to be a truly physical human descendant of Abraham. But it seems like he would have to be more. In order to bring blessing to all the families of the world, it seems that this truly human heir of Abraham would have to be at least omnipresent and eternal. Everywhere at all times and eternal. How else could he bless all the families, all the nations of the earth throughout all of time. It puts us in a bit of a bind as we read the genealogy because name after name after name were introduced to Jacob and Joseph and others and what we see are people who are physical descendants of Abraham but are not endowed with the divine attributes necessary to fulfill this promise. But Jesus is not only the son of Abraham, He's also the son of David, the son of David. And this is the one that Matthew seems most concerned with here and throughout the rest of Matthew. And look at your Bible again. Look at verse 6 of Matthew 1. And uh, David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Now again, the mystery of Christmas is on display that the family that God is working through is a family like this, where the, the very genealogy itself, what was entered into the official records, had to contain details of lurid affairs. And yet Jesus didn't blush at the reading of his genealogy. In fact, I think he smiled broadly because he loved people like David, like Bathsheba, like Uriah, David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. David was the prototypical king of Israel. He was the great king. He was a man after God's own heart. He wrote many of the Psalms. He was often faithful. He loved the Lord. And in 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 14, God promised David, when your days are fulfilled, fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. 
and he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now again, some of this makes sense, and it's just the language of the blessing given to a king. To bless him, to establish his kingdom, to raise up his offspring after him, uh, even to be a father to him. This is language known in the Old Testament, God being a father to Israel, to kings. And yet there's one line that we can't quite fit into the scheme. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, even David knew that that was unusual. Now, there had been long-lasting dynasties up until that point, down in the land of Egypt, maybe over in Assyria, other places. But nobody reigns forever. But then along is, comes Solomon. We have Solomon, who is the natural heir of the promises to David. And you wonder if David is thinking, maybe, just maybe, God is going to do something so unique through Solomon that it will change the entire course of human history. Maybe Yahweh will come back and dwell among us, tabernacle with us in the way that he did with Adam and Eve. Maybe this is the consummation. Maybe it will be my son Solomon in whom God will fulfill these promises, not only to our forefather Abraham, but now to me as the king of Israel. And in fact, Solomon's name means peaceful, and under his rule, Israel enjoyed a long period of peace in the kingdom. Solomon's great strength was wisdom that was given by God, and he governed more wisely than anyone had ever governed before him. Solomon then built the temple in Jerusalem for God. It was one of the wonders of the ancient world. Uh, wealthy world rulers traveled great distances just to see the temple and to hear Solomon's wisdom in person. Well, this is looking pretty good. Some of these things really are unique and spoken of with, uh, uh, not hyperbole, but uh, just in the language of most, Solomon was wiser than any who had ever come before him, we're told. And so maybe David, maybe even Solomon began to think, I wonder if this is it. Is God going to use Solomon to finally fulfill these lines of promise and, and establish God's kingdom on earth in a more direct way? The kind of way that we read about in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah and Isaiah. Maybe this is it. But Solomon's reign ended in miserable failure. 1 Kings 11 Starting at verse 7, then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their gods. First thing Solomon did was to amass hundreds of of wives and concubines. The next thing he did was in order to please his hundreds of wives and concubines who wanted to worship their murderous false gods, he said, okay, okay, dear, you know what? The high place you want, I got it. And on the mountain east of Jerusalem, in view, no doubt, of the temple, he built these two different high places where the pagans could worship their pagan gods. Now here in mixed company with adults present, I can't describe to you what that worship was like. Suffice it to say, Solomon, with his particular foibles, probably loved it. These were fertility cults, and it was unspeakably inappropriate what happened in the worship of these false deities. And at least in the case of Molech, child sacrifice was also common. And Solomon led the way for this to happen on the hill across the valley from the temple itself. Verse 9 says, And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. God is gracious to warn us and convict us of our sin. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded, 
Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. That is why this genealogy in this central panel runs from David, not just to Solomon, but to the deportation of the entire nation to Babylon, that great horrible center of the rejection of God and rebellion against God and idolatry that started so long ago in the plains of Shinar. God said, I will give you what you want. And the nation was ransacked, besieged, and led captive out to Babylon to live out a 70-year sentence. But God, in his infinite grace, allowed them to return. And so we get that third panel there. We need to pause and ask, why, did, why choose David and Solomon in the first place then? Why did God do that? Well, that's part of the mystery. And I, for one, am so glad that it is. Because that mystery points to the other great mystery, the fact that God can choose and use sinners like you and me to be part of his family and to accomplish his will and to glorify him now and enjoy him forever. Oh, that's a mystery. It's a blessed mystery that God can choose and use the lustful, adulterers, idolaters, and those who have squandered wisdom and wealth. He can choose and use those that have done all those things and more. He can save us from those sins and sanctify us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and employ us for His glory, even sinners like you and me like Solomon, like David, like Isaac, like Abraham. He can save us from all the sins, the types of sins that they have committed and all the sins that you and I have committed. And that is why God became human. That is part of the mystery of the manger, and we should marvel. Many of your kitchens are bedecked with Christmas cards that feature a quaint wooden manger with with chisel marks and hay spilling over the edges, lit maybe by a fire, and there's soft sheep there, and the cattle are lowing, and Mary and Joseph are staring down with proud new parent eyes, and that's wonderful. I love those aspects of Christmas. There's nothing wrong with that. But let me tell you this. We will miss the mark by a mile if the wood of that manger doesn't immediately draw our hearts and minds to the wood of the cross. Every time you see the hay-covered wood of the manger on a Christmas card, let God draw your heart up. Let him fix your eyes on the blood-covered wood of the cross because that's why God became man in a manger. So he could grow and live a sinless life. So he could do what we failed to do. Obey God perfectly and never succumb to temptation. So that he could stand in our place as a willing sacrifice. It was the will of the Lord to crush him there for our sins. God poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross after he took our sins in his body. Oh, that, that is a mystery to marvel at. And it started in the manger when we consider the humanity of Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. Yeah, we should marvel. But back, back to the text. To fulfill the promises made to David, God would have to raise up somebody else. Solomon couldn't do it. God would have to raise up a physical heir, someone that was a physical heir of Abraham, uh, of David, or a legal heir of David, preferably both. How else could he reign sovereign forever on David's throne? But anyone who could accomplish the things foretold by God about, about this heir of Abraham and heir of David would have to be greater than all who came before him. He would have to be human, true, physical heir of these men, real human. But he would have to be more. He would have to have divine attributes. He would have to be, well, God. But how could this be possible? Well, that's exactly what Matthew 1, 18 to 25 is doing on the record. 
Matthew explains how God could raise up a real, true man, an heir of Abraham and David, without the trappings of sin, a true man capable of doing what only true God could do, one in whom God could fulfill the fullness of his eternal promises to Abraham and David. That's what Matthew is explaining in verses 18 to 25. Look at it with me. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Truly human. Truly God. Human and God both involved in Jesus' conception. It is the body of Mary and it is the work of the Holy Spirit bringing about this miraculous virginal conception. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Why? Because no one believed then, just like they wouldn't now, when Mary said, yes, I'm pregnant, but no, I have not been with a man. You see, it's from the Holy Spirit. That didn't play well then. Even Joseph didn't believe her at first. But Joseph is a righteous man. Joseph was willing to embrace and marvel at mysteries that he couldn't understand or explain. And after marveling at the mystery of this manger, he was willing to move forward in obedience of what he could understand, and that was the direct command of God. Look at 20, but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, and she will bear a son, and you, Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's what Jesus means. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Here we get Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. And he took his wife, but he knew her not, until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. He called his name Jesus. Now, Jesus could fulfill the promises to Abraham and David, because he was not only a son of God, not only the anointed Messiah of God, but he was also, by virginal conception and birth, now a son of Mary, a real, true, human, young woman in Israel who was herself a descendant of Abraham and David. He is both the spirit-conceived, virgin-born son of God and also really and truly the son of Mary and legally the son of Joseph. Now we have one in whom, mystery of mysteries, all of these promises can be fulfilled. This is the great mystery of Christmas. And we need to take time to let our hearts marvel at the mystery of the manger. God praises the faith of children. Children have no problem marveling, humbly enjoying the mystery that's before them. They accept the joy of a thing and they reject the need to understand perfectly and control a thing before they submit to it and enjoy it. And this is why Jesus pointed to children in the crowd and said, you need faith like this child. This child isn't even trying to plumb the depths of who I am and what I've done and yet they know that I am good. And they are here and they are smiling and they are laughing and Jesus was delighted to scoop kids up in his arms and use them as an example of ideal faith. Children are good at unpretentious, self-forgetful worship. True, joyful wonder at the mysteries of God. Children are great at that. You and I, not so much. As adults, we have to fight our way back to that kind of humble worship of God. 
Now, maybe even secular people love the feeling of wonder and mystery surrounding Christmas because that's exactly the feeling God wants us to have. He just wants all of our marveling to be at the mystery of the manger, at God and human flesh come to save sinners. I want to end with another quote from Diedrich Bonhoeffer. And he's referring again to this mystery, but please understand that every time he says mystery, he's referring to our sovereign God's mysterious providence. He's referring to our God and the ways that he works, some of which Scripture tells us we will never fully understand. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that God reveals belong to us and our children, that we can walk in them. And Bonhoeffer is pointing us to that other side of the equation, the deep end with no bottom. These mysteries of God's sovereignty, of his providence, of his his plan of salvation, of the fact that God could become man to die for sin and rise again. And Bonhoeffer wants us to embrace that kind of mystery till we can worship God. Now listen, he says, the lack of mystery in our modern life is our downfall and our poverty. A human life is worth as much as the respect it holds for the mystery. We retain the child in us to the extent that we honor the mystery. Therefore, children have open, wide-awake eyes because they know that they are surrounded by the mystery. They're not yet finished with this world. They still don't know how to struggle along and avoid the mystery as we do. Now, we destroy this mystery because we sense that here we reach the boundary of our being because we want to be Lord over everything and have it at our disposal, and that's just what we cannot do with the mystery. Living without mystery means knowing nothing of the mystery of our own life, nothing of the mystery of another person, nothing of the mystery of the world. It means passing over our own hidden qualities and those of others in the world. It means remaining on the surface taking the world seriously only to the extent that it can be calculated and exploited and not going beyond the world of calculation and exploitation. Living without mystery means not seeing the crucial processes of life at all and even denying them. But Christmas is a wonderful time for us to humbly admit as children of God, as servants of the King, God There are things about you and the way that you have brought about salvation that I will never fully understand. But God, I will never tire of trying and worshiping you in amazement all along. That's what we should be saying at Christmas. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for displaying it in Jesus. We confess openly to you, God, that we are finite and we are sinful. And on both fronts, our minds are dulled to your truth. And we will never understand some things perfectly. And yet, Father, you have revealed so much to us, so clearly, that we know who you are. We know what you have done in Christ. And we know who we are in Christ. And through the power of your word, you can change us, empower our obedience. You can choose and use us for your glory and your service the way you did Abraham and Isaac and David and Solomon and Rahab and Ruth and all the others in this list. And Father, we thank you. We confess the limits of our knowledge and we ask that you would lift our hearts to marvel at the mystery of the manger this Christmas. Father, we thank you. We praise you and we ask all of this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.